Hey, this is Steve Guttenberg. I am the Audiophiliac, and I am here with Andrew Jones from ELAC. And you're going to help me out with impedance. Everybody asks me and asks you to explain the meaning of impedance and whether or not their receiver amplifier will work with a 4-ohm speaker, an 8-ohm speaker. Clear the air. Take it away, Andrew. <laughs> the meaning of impedance. Yeah. It seems more difficult than understanding the meaning of life, it's it right. seems at times. Yeah, it seems that way. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly to me anyway is there is an international standard for rating nominal impedance of loudspeaker and it's a very simple specification mm. if you say the nominal impedance is let's say eight ohms uh, what we mean is the minimum impedance shall not fall below 80 percent of the nominal impedance mm. so in the case of an 8 ohm speaker, 80% of that is 6.4 ohms. Mm. The minimum should not drop below that mm. over the defined frequency range of the speaker. Mm. And the defined frequency range of the speaker is the minus 10 dB points. Okay. So you've got a frequency range and you've got a minimum level it should not drop below. Mm. So 8 ohm speaker means 6.4 ohms, 6 ohm speaker means 4.8, and a 4 ohm speaker need, means 3.2. Very simple. Unfortunately, a speaker isn't very simple. So that's not really a very comprehensive understanding of what the impedance characteristic of the speaker is. Mm. So let's go back to basics. Let's take a resistor. We know from Ohm's law precisely how much current will flow if we apply a certain voltage to a certain uh, resistance, mm -hmm. right? Um, regardless of frequency. So if we were to take a swept sine wave, for example, sweep it from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz into an 8 ohm load, the current will remain the same at all frequencies. If we take a complex musical signal, we can exactly predict how much current at each frequency band will flow mm -hmm. because it's a resistance. Now let's get into a speaker. It couldn't be further away <laughs> from a simple resistance. It's almost never a resistance unless you do some extraordinary uh, jiggling with the crossovers. Like the original KEF 1042 was uh -huh. a constant resistive impedance. A magnapan, mm. because of its technology, mm. is pretty much a constant resistance. So you know what you're getting. Regular moving coil speakers or electrostatics are not a simple impedance. A closed box will have a resonant frequency where the impedance rises, typically, let's say, 40, 50, 60 hertz, depending on the cutoff of the speaker. It will then start wait, wait, to... Wait, so when it rises, how high would it be? Aha! Uh -huh. Well, it could go 30 or 40 ohms. Really? Oh, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, electrostatic can go to hundreds of ohms at certain frequencies. It all depends on the design of the driver. Mm -hmm. Then it will fall to uh, an in-band minimum typically somewhere around 100, 150 hertz. Mm -hmm. Then it'll start rising because the voice coil has some inductance. Uh, and the crossover components will almost always cause a rise in impedance at the crossover frequency. Mm -hmm. It'll then drop back down again through the treble range until it starts rising at the high frequency range. A vented box will have a double hump at the low frequencies say maybe at 30 hertz and at 60 hertz with a minimum at the tuning frequency let's say 55 hertz mm -hmm. so it's just going boom 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 right. so uh, a six ohm speaker most of the time isn't actually at six ohms right and if we're going to follow the convention mm -hmm. that simply said the minimum of this eight ohm speaker is 6.4 ohms then you look at all these humps it cannot go below 6.4 at the minimum between the humps, mm -hmm. but it will, by definition, therefore, be higher everywhere else. And we don't even say how high that can be. Mm -hmm. The original debut was 20 or 30 ohms in the treble region. Mm -hmm. It was um, from memory, don't, <laughs> don't quote okay, me on that. Okay. Um, but very high. So uh, all we care about is the minimum. Unfortunately, what does that mean in terms of what the amplifier is required to produce? Let's go back to that simple swept sine wave. Mm -hmm. We sweep with a sine wave. At some point, the current draw will be much higher than everywhere else, and that's where that minimum impedance is. Mm -hmm. But with music, when we've got a complex musical spectrum that's constantly changing, it's very difficult to predict 
what the current flow is. And that's what we care about with minimum impedance. How much current does the amplifier have Will to that provide? Will that little receiver have enough guts to yes. not crap out, basically? Now, because music most of the time is fairly complex and the power is spread across the spectrum, mm -hmm. then in the frequency ranges where the impedance is high, it's not demanding much current draw. So most times on music, the current demand isn't as high as we'd think when we rate it as a four ohm speaker, for okay. example. Okay. And that's if we're following the convention, mm -hmm. if we're true, if we're quoting it accurately. But maybe you have tom-toms, and maybe the energy is concentrated right at the minimum okay. of where the impedance is. So for the duration of those particular instruments, you'll have a higher instantaneous current draw. Is that going to be a problem? Probably not, because again, if you've got music concentrated in a very narrow spectrum at that frequency, it's almost never going to be taxing the amplifier to full output level. You'd be deafening yourself if you did that. So in practice, impedance is not as much of an issue unless you're at the party and right, <laughs> you've right. forgotten to tell people don't turn the volume control up this high. Right. So short of extreme situations of parties or playing speakers outside or something, the reality is whether your receiver says 8 ohms or 6 ohms or 4, it doesn't really matter except in extreme circumstances. Yes. Is that fair? It's kind of fair, but of course we have to be mindful of manufacturers, of what people are going to <laughs> do. Sued, and we, yes, so we have to absolve ourselves of any blame. Mm -hmm. So that's why there is a standard, mm -hmm. but because it's such a complex issue, mm -hmm. the standard couldn't really follow all the potential complexities, so it makes it easy. Mm -hmm. And thereby, we can't really predict what is going to happen. Right. So from a legal point of view, we follow the standard and say the minimum value is mm -hmm. follows the standard. But we know it's only over a relatively narrow frequency range. Mm -hmm. um, but you've always got this uh, issue when you're designing that you can't have everything. Sorry, <laughs> I try as best as I can, but you can't have everything. Just like with efficiency, box size, bandwidth. Right. You can well, pick we're, gonna, we're gonna do that as a separate video. No, I I get that, but right. it's everything comes down to choices. Mm -hmm. So if you lower the impedance the apparent sensitivity increases. So if I design it as an 8-ohm system mm -hmm. with a sensitivity of, let's say, 84, mm -hmm. if I redesign it as a 4-ohm system, mm -hmm. its sensitivity is now 87, ah. right? Yeah, I didn't know Because So sensitivity is not efficiency. Mm -hmm. I have not changed the efficiency. I've changed the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Why does that matter? Mm -hmm. Because an amplifier provides voltage control. Mm -hmm. So you switch from a speaker of 87 dB sensitivity mm -hmm. to one of 84, and you go, oh, that's quiet. It's lost all its dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's only because it's quieter. Uh, the efficiency is the same, but it's quieter. So it's a way of cheating to gain apparent advantage on a switchover of the old days of just switching from one speaker to another on a switch box. Oh, okay. Right? One plays louder is better. Right. Um, so ultimately, you care about impedance, you care about sensitivity, um, and we want to be true to the one standard that there is, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't easily give a concept of, in under normal operating conditions, how much are you going to be taxing the amplifier? Mm -hmm. And unless you're playing really loud, most times, especially these days with all the protection circuitry that's typically built into, uh, say, receivers these days, mm -hmm. what's likely to happen is if it starts overheating because it's trying to produce too much power, it will just stop. You know, it'll turn off <laughs> or protect in that sense, or it'll have current limiting. Right. So that once it tries, you try and draw too much current, it'll say, no, no, I'm not going to give you any more. Um, it might sound distorted when it's doing that, but it's 
basically protecting itself. But as a speaker manufacturer, I cannot rely on that. Mm. Um, so I have to say, you know, this one I'm rating as a four-ohm system, which means it could, for some range, drop down to 3.2, mm -hmm. but everywhere else it's going to be higher than that. Mm. And uh, combined with the fact that sometimes as I'm designing it, I find the minimum impedance dropped to four ohms. What do I call that? Mm. I could call it a five ohm system because 80% of five ohms is four ohms. Right. No one's going to understand. I'm going to get even more questions. Right. Well, my amplifier manufacturer has rated it into eight ohms and six ohms. Right. What do I do with five ohms? Mm -hmm. Well, it's like this, you see, and it gets back into that complicated conversation. But I want to bring it back to the beginning. So, <clears throat> in a practical sense, if you're if a lot of people always say, "Oh, I don't play really music that loud," blah blah blah. In, a, in an everyday guy situation, should they be? fretting, should they look at that impedance spec and say, no, I can't buy this, not just yours, I mean any speaker that let's say rated at four ohms. Is that a reason not to buy a given speaker? So, <laughs> off the record, on the record, <laughs> yeah. um, you shouldn't fret too much, given at least one cop out on that statement, okay. that you've honestly rated according to the international standard. Okay. Now, not everybody does that, mm -hmm. or sometimes there's a kind of a halfway where eight ohm compatible. Okay. Uh -huh. We don't really know what that means. Okay. Some people will say at least, let's say eight ohm compatible, minimum of such and such. Mm -hmm. So at least you do know there mm -hmm. what the minimum, and it's not, in that case, it's not obviously trying to be dishonest. Mm -hmm. It's trying to make the point that the standard is so simplified that it doesn't clearly represent what's going to happen in practice. So trying to get sort of a halfway house between not cheating, but trying to represent the case. If it's mostly above six ohms, you're going to be okay. But it's just this little Andrew, you're this confusing here. people. I know, but it is a... <laughs> Because there is no straightforward answer. Okay. Other than to say, you yeah, know, well, you're probably going to be okay. But I can't, if, if someone calls in and says, my amplifier is only spec'd into eight or six, mm. I'm not going to say that uh, absolutely you can use my forum speaker. Because if anything goes wrong with the amplifier, it's kind of on me. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes what some amplifier manufacturers do, they give a continuous power 8 ohms and 6 ohms, let's say. Right. And maybe that's also what's quoted on the back panel. It'll say 8 ohm or 6 ohm right. rating. Right. Right. But when you look at the manufacturer's specifications, not some review of it where they've tested it thoroughly, but the actual manufacturer's specifications, um, it will say burst power into eight, six, four, and two ohms. That implies to me they run it into speakers or loads as low as two ohms, and it was able to give briefly, you know, musically inclined brief periods, uh, it was able to drive two ohms. So that gives me the hope of saying under those circumstances, if they quoted burst power down into two ohms, then it's probably going to be even, there, even more Even okay. there you're hedging. I'm surprised. You're like, well, yeah, because you can never be absolutely it's sure. It's a freaking receiver. It's, you know, two ohms? Come on. They do them. They do? Okay. Yeah, there's a, a number of receivers from, I think, at least Yamaha and Denon that will okay. do that burst power rating. So that gives me more confidence to say, you know, you're going you're gonna to be okay. But what you'll find probably, is if you then call them manufacturer of the receiver, mm. they will hedge their bets as well and say, oh, no, 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 you know, don't use a speaker lower than six ohms. Because everybody is trying to make sure that they're not culpable. So, uh, Andrew, you should never make four-ohm speakers, is what you're saying. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you did this to yourself. I did it to myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we should end it there. Anyway, thank you, Andrew. This is Steve Guttenberg, the 